Which of you has ever been to Mumbai in India? I have, but then again, I haven't. Let me explain. I still vividly remember in 1997, a while ago, I was sitting with my twin brother in the computer room of his school, and we were drinking instant coffee, and we could log into a website where we could see a webcam that was facing a random square in Mumbai in India. And gradually, we got to see what was happening over there in real time. And I was, I was captivated. I was hypnotized. And I had a similar experience in 2014 when I watched a video of a technology congress and I saw an artificially intelligent system from the company called DeepMind. And they played the game called Breakout. And it had no rules pre-programmed in advance. It learned by itself just by doing. And within a few hours, this system reached the high score. And once again, I was hypnotized. I was captivated by this. And it might not surprise you, but the very day it was possible, I bought an Apple Watch, an Amazon Alexa smart speaker, a Google Home Assistant. I have now apps that complement my sentences, suggest books to me, convert my speech into written text, and even send me a notification when they think I'm in the middle of a workout. <coughs> so we see this qualitative rise of artificial intelligence, and this will give us superhuman cognitive capabilities. A qualitative growth spurt in the field of artificial intelligence especially the domain of machine learning and deep learning. So you no longer have to tell a computer exactly what the world looks like. As long as you feed it with enough digital examples, it can learn by itself. We will gain superhuman cognitive capabilities. These systems will give us answers to questions we didn't even know we had. And there are now even systems that have human-like capabilities, such as seeing, talking, and listening. So a qualitative growth spurt in the field of artificial intelligence. For example, an AI system detected false police statements. And because people who have been robbed talk a lot about the details in the experience. And people who give a false statement, they talk a lot about the stuff that has been stolen. And an AI system detected this. So once again, artificial intelligence systems will give us superhuman cognitive capabilities. But let's not be naive. It's not that with this rise of artificial intelligence, everyone will be better off. Because algorithms made with good intentions can lead to unintended and unforeseen harmful effects. And when I have to highlight just one disadvantage, it's algorithmic decision-making. The fact that algorithms are increasingly making decisions about us, for us, and on our behalf. And this also has some disadvantages. Because, for example, companies and governments are increasingly outsourcing their decisions to smart computer models. And they train their, data, their models with data. But this data is often messy, it's biased, it's wrongly classified, etc., etc. So, as a result, these algorithmic models also make biased decisions. And discrimination and exclusion can be expected when we let these systems choose the winners and the losers. So, we must be very alert about this. And this means a lot for you and for me and for my wife, my children, my brother. You do or do not get a mortgage, an insurance, leave or not, contract with an employer or not, etc., etc. And certainly when these systems are not transparent, we must avoid constantly dealing with the hat from Harry Potter's film, right? Where nobody knows exactly what is happening, but you are confronted with an irreversible outcome. And I know there are a lot of software developers creating software that can detect our emotions based on our nonverbal movements, our voice, our facial expression, etc., etc. But we have to be critical because the face is not as universal as we think. And facial expression 
And the face is not like a Walt Disney film where it's a one-dimensional mirror to the soul. Am I right? And what if this emotional intelligence software is being used in a police interrogation, a job interview, a performance interview, etc., etc.? And when we talk about algorithmic decision-making, we have to talk about the digital butler. It's a metaphor for all these smart apps, smart devices, smart speakers, smart websites, etc. And in the future, this digital butler will increasingly understand who we are, what we do, and why we are doing this. They will increasingly make decisions about us, for us, and on our behalf. But that is interesting because we must be aware of the disadvantages. The advantages are clear. The digital butler will answer email on your behalf. They will reschedule an appointment in your calendar based on a recently received voicemail. They will answer questions you didn't even know you had. And they will help you before you knew you needed help. That's interesting. But I am afraid that our enormous appetite for personalized services, comfort and insights will let us forget the disadvantages on the long term. One of these disadvantages is the fact that we, cons that we reflect less on our own consumption because the software makes it so easy to consume and to buy and to reorder and to renew thoughtlessly. More stuff and more surfaces, but the question is whether it makes us happier. Because do not forget, a lot of tech companies are only driven by a commercial motive and they lack a moral compass. And the second danger of this digital butler is that it deprives us from autonomously unraveling our own wishes and ideas. Because 86% of the people with my profile like pizza with pineapple, I'll probably like it too. But that's not the case. And our taste and that of our children can be manipulated towards the commercially most appealing outcome. And Amazon determines the birthday present for my brother. And Google Maps determines how I travel. And Facebook determines what kind of news we consume and thus determines our worldview. And Tinder chose a friend's life partner. And we must prevent our lives from taking place in autoplay. For real. And the third danger of the digital butler is that because this butler deprives us of inner inconvenience, we become less tolerant of inner inconvenience. And you may think it's a silly thought, but it's not, because we've seen a similar process with the rise of the smartphone. We can all remember. This deprives us of uncomfortable boredom, but we need boredom. I mean, seriously, when was the last time you were bored or saw someone who was bored? You know what I mean. And I'm also a little bit afraid that the digital butler and the on-demand economy and this extreme customer centricity mistakenly gives us the idea that the whole world revolves around us. Does the digital butler strengthen individualism? Okay. But I don't know, are there solutions? Well, of course there are. First of all, governments and companies need to be very critical about the software they are going to use or develop in-house. They must create or use trustworthy AI with a human focus, and that is important. But also, we can do something as a public. We can educate ourselves about the benefits and the disadvantages of the qualitative rise of artificially intelligent systems. So congratulations. By attending my talk today, you've made one of the better decisions of the day. <laughs> and I also made a decision. I've put my Amazon Alexa speaker in the closet and my Google Home Assistant, and there they are now collecting dust. And to their great annoyance, I often tell my children about the drawbacks of this technology. But the real solution the real solution to invisible algorithmic decision-making lies within ourselves. We must explore, expand and strengthen our human capabilities, our light side and our dark side. First of all, the light side, the human capabilities. And to distinguish ourselves from smart computers, we must embrace 
our capabilities, uh, the, the use of fantasy and creativity, but especially empathy, compassion, attachment, warmth, affection, because these are the emotions we are going to need in the future to maintain the human touch in the decision-making processes of the future. And also on an individual level, we have to explore our talents, our passion and our purpose. So no more autoplay, but follow your purpose. Very important. And this whole process makes you agile and gives you fulfillment. And the latter is very important. Let me explain. So let's have a look at your darker emotions. Because as I indicated earlier, I'm afraid that this digital butler will make us less tolerant of inner inconvenience because these systems deprive us of inner inconvenience. But we have to embrace discomfort. We have to embrace discomfort. Let me tell you a short story. As a teenager, I sometimes found it difficult to face my darker emotions. Things like my fears or my anger. And every discomfort from the outside world related to these uncomfortable emotions. But now that I'm an adult, I know we need discomfort. We need friction, we need frustration, because it's the gateway towards reflection. Reflection on our own inner emotions. And when we do this, we will grow as a human. In the past years... I faced my darker emotions and I grew as a human and I took new steps. So discomfort is the engine, is the gateway towards inner reflection, human growth and taking new steps. And by this we will grow as human beings. We will simply be more fulfilled from the inside. And by doing so we will always distinguish ourselves from smart computers. We will maintain the human touch in the decision-making processes of the future. And we will ultimately be less sensitive to the suggestion, the manipulation, and the distraction of all this smart software. And establishing a connection with others helps us, but establishing a connection with ourselves does so in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you.